Good morning, everybody. I am going to start. Uh, welcome to class. Welcome to this week. Uh, and happy Wednesday. We are on October 21st, and we will be continuing our discussion on classification, which we started uh, on Monday, uh, and it will be the topic for this week and part of what's going to happen next week. The topic for today has to do with neighbors, and we're going to look for K of them, the closest ones, K nearest neighbors, and this is done for the purpose of classification. It's one class of algorithms uh, in some sense, but it also is going to bring us into topics that are related, uh, that are related to this method in particular, but also broader things in machine learning, both supervised and unsupervised actually, but we will see them in the context of supervised problem, classification problem. And so it's going to bring us a few notions. This is a good example for me to tell you about the way things are organized in this class. Uh, I don't have a book, as you all know, and I don't have a way to say, you know, here is what we need, all the definitions we ever need. And so we go through them. And then we say, we come back and look at methods. We, we don't do that. We introduce things as we need them, as they come up. And so this particular discussion will bring us things around assessing classification algorithms and things like that. That's why I wrote the message yesterday to tell you about this and that I need all 50 minutes of it. I'm so greedy. I need every single minute of the lecture time we have so we cover. So, so for that reason, I would like you not only today, but other times to be ready. So we start exactly at 9.10 for the discussion we will have. Our topic is Kenyros neighbors classification. Uh, the picture you see here uh, as um, inspiration for it, the one on the right, and that's neighbors, as if you haven't paid attention, and this is neighbors version 2020, where things are a little different, as you all know, and so see, it's, it's picked from something that I found on when I googled, but it has to also show, you know, we stay connected, even though we are apart physically, and, and, and so that's also a little bit of a reminder for that, and that also brings me to something that I would like to do as a motivation for what we want to have as a warm-up question today. Uh, and that is what I am trying to say with the picture on the left. And I want you to listen to me and I want you to tell me uh, how, how you want to respond to this one. Uh, so it's going to be a fairly soft, kind of complicated, not as what's your favorite type of question. And so I'm going to need somebody who can help me out with this one in a good way. And so I'm going to pose the warm-up question and you will be ready and you will write. But Harry, I've never had him have the honor of writing a warm-up question. Harry, be ready and you will be the person to write the warm-up question, but I need to first tell what it is. So we have come now to October 21st in this fall semester, the first eight weeks are over, we just began our ninth week, you all survived your midterms and everything else that you have to do uh, last week and you have heard and, and so in some ways there is an advantage, we have found out how things are in terms of having to do things online, uh, you're learning and you're doing a good job, by the way, in this class and other classes I hope, uh, but it is also something that could be a bit of a challenge and that challenge I think has to do with paying attention how much of your attention is there for all of the 50 minutes or 75 minutes, depending on how the lecture is, when things are happening online. So it's not your fault. The medium itself is open for distractions. There may be you know, a phone that could ring or, or you, you're not, your camera is not on. I don't require it because maybe you want to reduce your bandwidth or you may have other reasons and it's okay. But, but you may actually sometimes get away from what is being discussed. So attention may be an issue. Uh, and so I want to know, this is a lead to my warm-up question, how you're doing in terms of paying attention to this class, not generally, to this class when things happen. And so I'm going to use an, uh, a number between one and 10. When you say 10 is I am 100% all the time very attentive, and one is I'm completely distracted, you don't even know what I'm doing, I just am there as if, you know, you don't see me, but I am just completely somewhere else, that would be a one. You are completely in the class, you're with me all the time is a 10. And so you can find a range to this one. So this is not anything like, I just wanted to know how challenging it is to pay attention uh, and how to, to stay focused for this one. So on a range from one to 10, how do you characterize your level of attention to class as it happens for this class? 
So that's part of the question. So you'll give me a number. The other part is what this picture is trying to show you. Uh, and one of the things that you could do when you're learning online is to have a, you know, a little bit of a discipline, and kind of be good at being attention. So maybe have some time or something like that, that you could say, this is where I am at. You know, be organized is the question. So if there is a word or something that you could use to tell me what you're doing to, to be attentive, I would appreciate that. So you give me a number and you give me what is working best for you to increase your attention, to be best, good at attention. So I don't know how to say this. That's why I picked Harry. I know he's very smart and he can pick up, find a way to say this very complicated warm up question. On a scale of one to 10, how do you characterize your level of attention in this class? What has worked well for you to cope with paying attention when things are happening online? These are two questions. You can think of them and answer them together. You have a number and, and something else. Or if you uh, have already given me a number and you give me your best strategy for coping with attention, I will take that one also, OK? If you do it in one shot, great. If not, then you can do it. Harry is the responsible person for writing the warm-up question. Your task is to go ahead and tell me how things are going. OK, that's our business today. And I'm going to get started with uh, or start discussing k nearest neighbors for now. Uh, before I, I, I um, uh, start, uh, let me see if there is anybody who's got a question. You can unmute yourself and ask quickly. But let me actually tell you, uh, while you think about a question, if you have, where we are. Uh, uh, these slides are posted. Uh, my office hour is on Wednesdays, 10.30 to 12. That's immediately after this, this class. For some reason, the Zoom link on, on what you see on Blackboard was absent last time. Uh, I did, I was there uh, for students who came, no, no, no one came, okay. All right, so I'm telling you the truth. But, but, but I was wondering if it was because they didn't get the link and so I saw it, it is a recurring meeting and therefore it might have decided that it was over, but it is not. And so I created another one. So there is, if you go to the Zoom part in, uh, on, on Blackboard, you would see uh, Helen's office hours were still there and they're still there, but there is something called instructor office hour. So there is a new meeting I have there. So, so there's a, a new password or whatever it is that is needed for Zoom to happen is there. So if you need to see me today, I will be there. Uh, 10.30 to 12 is when I, um, that's my regular office hour. Uh, so I just wanted to point that out. The other thing is I have very few project proposals that I haven't read, but I have read the rest of it. If you haven't heard anything from me, you can assume that it means it is approved. If you haven't heard, if you have heard, then it is. But there are few. And the way Blackboard works, or at least the way I understand it, I need to go through all of them for me to be able to tell you. So you will formally hear from me there, but please don't get delayed. If you have to start, you can start. So for those who want to talk to me today, if it is related to your project proposals, you're welcome to do. So once I have released that on Blackboard, everybody who is approved to tell you, then I'm going to require that every team meets with me very briefly. And I will find some other time outside of the office hour because we'll need some time. And I'm going to try to find something that would work both for me and for your schedule. So maybe it will be late afternoon. I don't even mind if it is after five. So I'm going to make a uh, uh, some something where you can sign up or, or tell you how to come, but I want to meet with every single team before they get started with, the, or as they get started with their projects, okay? So the, today's office hour is not the only option you have. It is actually a requirement. I would like to have a very brief conversation as you get started with your projects. So assume that you are approved, make sure that you do sign up for something like this and talk to me uh, this week when I make the days available. If the office hour today works, you are welcome to stop in and very briefly talk about your project proposal or any other aspect of the course that's happening. Okay, those were the points I wanted to make. And I did not need Chris to take us to Blackboard today. So I will, we will stay here. This is not taken from the book. So pay attention to this one. And the power, the PDF versions of these slides are already posted. Okay. And it looks like there isn't any questions so far. Okay, so uh, the goal of K nearest neighbor, by the way, whenever you see K in computer science literature, computer science books and things like that, it's just one of those favorite letters. It's just got picked to say when you, it's just a number, when, when something top K, for example, they would say, or, or when it's parameterized and you're looking at complexity of algorithms, K would be one of the terms that's used 
I would I wonder sometimes why some things get chosen like that. So it's just a number. So the nearest neighbors who will unpack it will understand it now, but you're using K of them and it would have been called something else. And so the name is more or less a standard now. You can open up something and it, you know you still see, it. there is no textbook that would call it L nearest neighbors algorithm. They would still say K. So what the goal is here is to classify and you have labels and you are going to, uh, uh, when a new uh, object comes, you're going to label it automatically by having to look at how close it is to its neighborhoods uh, and then give the label that is, uh, that is the closest among uh, things that you have considered. That's the goal. So the idea is based on similarity. And so you have a notion that you would uh, bring in uh, to characterize how you can assess similarity between items. And you would say something is close when it is similar. And, and you, would, you, you would rank things. And so you will be uh, looking at K of them after you have fixed a K. And you would see, you know, when you look at your neighborhood, K of them, uh, who, what their labels. Uh, one of them has got one label, another one has got another label, or some of them may have the same label. And so they would say, no, please, you are like me, so be like me you know, be colored like me. And this other guy would also compete for that one. So if they agree, or if the majority of them, uh, then that will be the label what uh, the object, the new item will get. We know the season we are in, so there is election here, there's voting here, and we are going to go with majorities. So the intuitive idea behind K nearest neighbor classification is to look for uh, the label for an item by looking at the K closest neighbors to it and see what they are saying, what label they have. And we give the, uh, the item that we are trying to classify the, the majority among those K. To automate this, which is why we're discussing it, to call this a machine learning algorithms, there are two decisions that need to be made. One, is a fundamental decision to say, how do I assess similarity? How do I define similarity? The second is, what is my K? In other words, how many are allowed to vote uh, to get into this consideration? Both of them are important, and both of them would bring in a lot of other things. So let's start with uh, this discussion uh, with when it's only one who votes. So, so you're already, you will be getting the label that's the closest to you. When an item comes, I'm going to look for an item that it's, we just have to, the, the closest one will decide. So for example, we've got this black object. We've got red and blue objects and the new one came. This is the one that we don't know its color and it is going to look at its neighborhood and the closest to it happened to be a red and so it gets the label red. This was because we considered only one label. Suppose we were going to consider not one, but three neighbors. So we're going to look at the closest three to this object and then see what their labels are and we go with the majority. And so in this case, when we still have that black object, it looked at its neighborhood. The closest three were two red and one blue. And so the object got a red. That became its label. So we classified it. When K was one, it, it got classified as red. When K was three, it got classified still as red. But if we were to increase our neighborhood, now we say it's not just the, you know, the house next to me or the house after that, but also everybody really in the neighborhood, in the village is my neighbor. That means I'm going to consider uh, in this particular example, K is equal to seven, then the label I get or this object gets may change. And it in fact did change. So, so when we extended the neighborhood now to K equals to seven, now the label that this object got is the neighborhood has got seven, four of them are blue, three of them are red. And so the object gets colored as blue or classified as blue. So in this particular example, we saw three values of K and in two of the cases, the decision that we ended up making on the label for the object happened to be one. And the case when K was seven happened to be another. So that means the value of K uh, is going to determine the classification algorithm's performance or what label we would give to an object. And so it becomes important as, as you can see. So I'm going to give you 
uh, an outline, uh, which I call the K nearest neighbor process overview. Um, we are going to come to a point where we'll have our lead meter, okay? Uh, and we haven't talked about it, but we will, I'll, I'll want to get to a place where it would, you'd get a chance for having to say, you know, we've discussed quite a number of topics, so we get a chance to read about them, and that's what the purpose of the exam would be. This could be a good example uh, for an exam. Uh, when, when things were done in paper, I would probably pick what, something like this. I would find a way to do it now when we are doing online, but this is a good way to get a good idea, and I want you to have it in your mind, to, to give an overview for this process that's going to happen. So, so think of this as, as a meta heuristic or as a, an algorithm of an algorithm. So there are many pieces in it, but you are going to try to describe this entire process as steps or the things that the ingredients that are needed for it. Uh, so let's go through them. So the first thing you need to do when you are going to apply k nearest neighbor, it is an effective algorithm, by the way, and it's not always good for everything. There are things that it is good for. There are things that it is not good for. Uh, things that have to do with anomaly detection, for example, surprisingly, among the very many things one can do, k nearest neighbors actually does a good job finding about, about them. Uh, but we're using it now for the purpose of classification, okay? So, so here is, uh, that's why we, it would be good to know methodically and, and systematically applying it. And so this is the overview. So the first thing to do is to decide what, how you're going to define similarity. In other words, distance metric. These two words are opposite. When things are similar, the distance between them is close. When things are dissimilar, the distance between them is large. So an equivalent way of talking about similarity would be to come up with a distance metric. This is something that will be important uh, on multiple levels. One, because it's going to be uh, dependent on what problem you're solving, what kind of data you have. You can imagine, and you will see in a slide or two, uh, be specific about this. Uh, whatever it is that you have as a distance, as a notion of a distance in one context will not be meaningful in another context. And sometimes you have multiple ways to talk about distance in the same context, and you may have a reason to favor one over another. So for these reasons, you would want to know, uh, to decide on what you would use as a similarity or a distance metric. That is point number one in this overview and should be in your head and you should remember it all the time. So the, a decision to be made and, and, and uh, um, to be applied, okay? The second thing has to do with uh, something that is broad. Uh, uh, one of the 101s of machine learning or data science would be, and especially when you have things that are supervised problems, classification of, or regression problems, uh, is to divide up your data into two. And we'll talk about cross-validation later in the uh, next week maybe or the week after uh, to, to as a way to evaluate. So one thing that you would always do is separate your original lead, uh, labeled data into training set and test set or training data and test data. And this has come now uh, because the evaluation of how well the method has done is one thing. That's what cross-validation would do. But actually you will need this because you are going to use how well it is doing to decide how the process is going to be put together. So you're going to split your original data into training set and test set. Now we're going to pick an evaluation metric to tell us how well uh, the method has done. That evaluation, the first one was, how do I decide similarity between objects? Because I'm going to use that to determine, you know, who is the closest. I have to find K of them the closest and therefore the notion of distance is important. I have split my data into training and test data. And now I'm going to evaluate the performance of that classification algorithm. And I've got different metrics. We'll, we'll see a good number of them today. And so based on that metric, I will say how well it has done. That's why the, the third step is needed. So we run K nearest neighbors, this method a few times by changing K because we don't know what K is good to use. For that cartoon example we saw, when k was one and when k was three, it led us to make one decision. And when k was seven, it led us to do another decision. Which one is better? We actually don't know what k is a good one to choose. And therefore, we run a few of them a few times by changing k and using the evaluation metric that we've used in step three, we say how, that, how well that method is done. So this way, in step five, we optimize k by picking the one with the best evaluation measure. 
just for a second, go with me to the regression discussions we have had. And so there was a time when we were trying to look for, you know, forward method and backward method, and you mix them up and so on, where you were to decide what features to include in your regression model. And I told you, you could use R squared or p-value, see how it's doing. If it is not helping you, you know, you leave it out. Or if you are doing it in the forward fashion, you uh, add the one that gives you the best improvement and things like that, right? Just like that, that was an evaluation metric we used, which was p-value or R squared. Now for our classification, which p-value doesn't make sense or, or R squared doesn't make sense, we have some other things. So we used some of the metric that we have decided on uh, finding out of how our method is doing. And so we pick now a K that has given us the best. We don't want to pick up K that has given us the worst uh, or something that is not as good as one other thing, right? So we optimize for K by picking the one that has got the best or yielded the best evaluation measure. Once we have chosen K, we have optimized. Now we use the same training set that we have used in step two and now create a test set with the data item you want to classify. This is the one for which you want to have a prediction and therefore you apply it. This is the K nearest neighbor process. Those of you are here and you're 51 of you, I don't know why the others are not here today. Uh, you should know this in your head, okay? So take your time to take a mental picture. If you're taking, if you're taking notes, you can take notes, but the slides are there, but you should remember them. Pick a similarity metric or a distance metric, divide up your data into training set and test set, decide on an evaluation metric, run K nearest neighbor a few times by changing K and pick the one that has given you the best one when it comes to this evaluation metric. And now, now you have settled on everything, including how many Ks you would use. And though you choose now, but with the, K, with the K you have chosen, you apply on the same training set and now do your prediction on the object that you're interested in, on the new item that you're interested in. There you have it. Okay, so now that we know the process, let's look at distance metrics or similarity metrics as they are called. So first let's try to see what could come. Okay, we have an empty slide here. And so we're going to populate this one. Uh, for those of you who are following on a PDF, you may see it, but I would encourage you not to do that. So just follow me along on, on this empty uh, slide. What are we doing? We are doing uh, one item and another item and we see how far apart they are. And what are these items? Where are they coming from? These are my, you know, my, I've got my cases, which is what rows would do if you think about data frame. Uh, and then you've got these features, right? And the columns, that is the one that will tell me the identity of an item. And so if I have one item here and another item here, one object here and another object here to talk about their distance, I have to see what features they have, right? So I can imagine there is a vector associated. So each item now is a vector, a vector that has got values on the first dimension is something, on the second dimension is something else, on the third is something else and so on, right? So how far apart are these two? So that I am looking for something that would measure distance in terms of objects that are vectors. That's a good starting point. So the most common one, you probably have heard this, and if you have taken other classes that have to do with machine learning, you probably have seen this, or even if you haven't done that, you probably have heard Euclidean distance. When I have two real valued vectors, when each of these vectors are, have values that are real, then I can talk about how far apart they are in Euclidean space. And this is a geometric notion that you would, you would know. Uh, I have object X and object Y, what's the Euclidean space? I would look at each of the coordinates, take the difference, square them, add them up, take the square root, that's the Euclidean distance. So this is defined when I have read valued vectors. It's not always the case that Euclidean distance is meaningful, but it is one of the most common ones uh, and, and someone that's used quite often. And this will be used when, whenever you have attributes that can be plotted on a plane or are higher dimensional space, okay? What about other things? You still have two real valued vectors. Euclidean distance is the most common one to use, but there are other things you could do. This is one of the more also common one, again, when you have real valued vectors, is to use something called cosine similarity. This one, you will notice some of these metrics that I will be discussing are termed in terms of distance. Others are termed in terms of similarity. And I've told you that inverse relationship between them when things are similar, the distance between them is small uh, when things are 
far apart, they are dissimilar, is one way to do it. So cosine is termed in terms of similarity because the notion of distance is kind of absent. What is this? This is will take you to your calculus classes, right? Your vectors. They're real valued, but these are vectors. When two vectors are the same or they are similar, they would kind of agree on the direction they are going. Okay? So if you take one vector and another vector, and I'm using my hands now as a vector, uh, whenever they are kind of similar, the angle between them is small. When they are very different, like orthogonal to each other, they have nothing to do with one another, then the angle between them is 90 degrees. Uh, and because they don't have any, so the, the way we would quantify this to get a number between zero and one is to take the cosine of that angle. So they're similar, there is no angle between them, the angle is zero, the cosine of that one will be one. So that's how strongly uh, similar they are. And when it is increasing, then the cosine value will get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And by the time it gets to 90 degrees, it will be zero. But it could get worse. It could actually get worse. They could actually be trending in the opposite directions. And so I could increase the angle be, be above 90 degrees, which means now I'm going to get even negative value. So instead of being similar, now they are being like enemies. So, so if it is 180 degrees, for example, then the cosine will be minus one. They cannot be any further apart is what it would mean. So cosine similarity would have a value that, that ranges between minus one and one. Zero is no similarity, no correlation at all. They're just perpendicular to one another. Zero is absolutely in line and 180 is one. So cosine similarity will be another metric and it is useful in some cases. The other metric is when it's not always that you have objects and the thing that characterizes that of the features are real valued. No, times there are times when they are actually sets. And when you have a set, you don't apply Euclidean distance or cosine similarity, you do something else. One of the common ones to do is called Jacquard distance. And, and this applies when you have two sets. Um, and, and think about these features now all the time, whenever you are thinking about an object and uh, its similarity with another object. It is, it is um, you're looking, looking for, 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 uh, for features. And so when they are not real valued, now I can think of situations where I have sets to compare. Jacquard distance says are two sets to compare, A and B. How similar are they? One way to say is, do they, have, do they overlap a lot? So that is a good, a good way to start. But then uh, I don't want to just take two sets, see how much they overlap that in their intersection and give that as a value. First of all, that will be uh, relative to the size of this vector. So I can have two sets. One of them has got five, the other one has got eight elements. And so they could overlap to some degree. And so I could get an answer like three, but then I could have another pair of sets. The other, you know, the, this other pair has 50 elements in the first one and 60 elements in the second one. And I could take the, their overlap. I would get a very big number. So which two pairs are similar, more similar? That would be hard to tell if I didn't actually pay attention to how big they were to begin with. And so that's why you would normalize it. And so you can take the intersection and divide it by the union of the two sets and you'll get now a number that will always be less than one because you will never have an, an overlap more than everything put together. And so now you have a nice good number that is normalized and that's what Jacquard distance would be. And this is something you would apply when you have sets to compare. A very good example, a very quick good example of this would be yourselves. Think about all your friends you are on Facebook and you've got friends and things like this. You've got your network. So I can think of you as a graph. And some other person you know would also have, you know, their own graph, their own network. How similar are you to another friend of yours? Or, or you can take in that same network. I shouldn't actually put another friend. So you just have your network. And within your network, you pick two of your friends or to our people you know, and you want to see how similar they are. One way you could do is take them, see what friends that they have, take this other one, how friends they have, and see if there is overlap between the two. So this will be a good example. You have a network and you are going to determine whether two nodes are similar to one another, or to what degree they are similar. There's very many other things that you could do to talk about similarity, but this will be a quick one. And so Jacquard distance, that is neighborhood. That's why it was a set. The feature was uh, a set instead of a real value one. Okay, we went through three. The fourth one is called humming distance. Humming like a bird would hum. Uh, so this would apply when you have things that you would compare, but they are strings. They're not real value, they're not sets, but they are strings. Like 
bioinformatics sequences or uh, natural language processing, one text, another, one word and another word. So you want to compare two things, they are strings. And so what will be a measure of a distance between them? The most common one to do is called a humming distance and it will look for the strings and compare them uh, letter by letter. And then say, when they are the same, you keep on doing. When they are different, you say in this, they differ. And so you count to one and then you can keep adding it. And so for example, if I have a word called cook and a word called cake, they agree on the first letter and disagree everywhere else. In fact, that everywhere else is three. And so the humming distance between them will be three. But if I have cake and cape, they differ only in one of the characters. K became a P and so the humming distance is a one. Um, this is also called edit distance in bioinformatics for those of you who are in that area. So when I have strings, humming distance is a common one to do. Uh, when we have real valued vectors, Euclidean distance, and cosine similarity are by far the more common ones to do, but they are not the only ones. There are situations where you would go by Manhattan distance. Manhattan distance comes from the Manhattan city, how things are in that city and how streets are. Uh, Pullman is not one of that type uh, of place, but it, think about how you would drive. And in a, in a city structure more like Manhattan, if you have two points to go to, you first have to go east and then you have to go north. There is no other way you can have this, uh, the, you know, the streets don't go uh, uh, in a shorter path than that. And so you, you may sometimes have to just do that. And there are some geometric problems where this would be the case. And there may be some other things where a Manhattan distance would be. So compare it to a Euclidean distance, you would see what's happening. So you're taking the absolute value of how things are in one dimension, and then you're just adding them to the other dimension. First, how far you went east to west, and then how far you were northwest, uh, north south, and then you add up these distances and that will be your Manhattan distance. So we saw five. This is not the only one, there are others. And these other ones are actually interesting because the world is not so plain all the time. So, so it's not as if you have everything is real valid vectors. And so should I choose Euclidean distance or Manhattan or should I use cosine similarity? Or the world is always about sets like the friends in the social network I told you. And so you can see overlaps between sets and you divide by the unit. No, sometimes you have things that are mixed. So you have this and you have that, you have this and you have that. So what would you do then? Well, it's nice because now you can get creative. So you can define your own custom designed metric to talk about distance now and apply it, which will now open up a whole lot of things for you to apply uh, K-nearest neighbors in a good way. So now I'm going to take you to a restaurant to explain this. And so let's see what we are, how we are doing in time. Uh, let me see for a second uh, what you told me about your attention. So there were lots of eights and sevens and sixes. I appreciate your honesty. There was nobody who told me their attention 10 the time all the time. Okay, uh, so I am going to assume that you are with me for now. And so here's a restaurant, you go and you eat and you leave tips. Uh, and people have observed this. And so you're now going to, uh, you know, that restaurant owner has hired you. And so they show you their data and then you're going to now predict when a new the customer comes, when they're going to give a big tip or not. That would be fun. Uh, so you here's the data that you're given. Uh, the people who come there uh, or to, to that restaurant when the food is great and there is you know chatting happening the service is fast and the price is kind of a different range and uh, there is a bar in the restaurant when these things happen the way they did for customer one great yes yes for the fast service price was normal and there was a bar they didn't care uh, they left big tip and there's another customer where this value that you see is the way it is and so they left a big tip if you see the third customer, uh, they thought the food was mediocre, they thought the chat was, you know, uh, I don't know what that actually means. I, I pulled this one from uh, uh, some place I saw, the f service was not fast and so they didn't give a big tip. Now, this is the data you have and what you're going to do now is to, first of all, you've decided on K equals to two. And so a new customer has come and your uh, decision to make is whether that customer is going to leave tip or not. And here is what, uh, this new coming, coming customer has given for these values. Now look, look at them. Some of these values are Boolean, some of them are uh, some other things, but you're going to now see how similar this one is to an existing customer. 
So the values they gave was great, no, no, normal, and no. So you're now going to do more like what the Hamming distance was doing. So you're going to correct, uh, look at these features and see how much they agreed and how much they disagreed. So it's not a Hamming distance because you are not necessarily looking for characters in a string, but you have defined now a vector, one, one thing that you've got here, a, a feature vector, and you're comparing it with another one and you've come up with your own thing. So if you see this and try to compare it with these four customers, you will see that it um, uh, there are uh, uh, the number two customer here would agree with this one because there is one mismatch and four matches in the choices that they gave. And customer two was saying yes. And so, but you have your case too. So you saw one, at least the closest one, and it's uh, it left a big tip. And so you are most likely going to say, now this one would also give a, a big tip, but you need to see two and see what they are saying. So the second most similar example to this one, where there is two mismatch and three matches. So you're counting the matches more is why the first one was most more similar. But that second one, which is uh, the first customer, or also left a big tip. And so you have two yeses. You looked for k equals to two, both of them say yes. And so you're not going to predict the new customer now is going to fortunately give big tip. And so you will decide that way. So your answer will be a yes. When another customer comes, and here is what you know their uh, uh, their uh, rating is or their evaluation of these things is, and you would see the most similar one is number three. It has got four matches and one mismatch, and that customer has said a no. And the second most uh, similar one is the number one customer. There are two matches and three mismatch, uh, three matches and two mismatches, and that one has said yes. So, so you are now in trouble. K equals to two. This, by the way, is a good example for what I'm going to tell you at the very last slide. Your K was two. One of them told you to go one way. The other one told you to go another way. That's a very bad situation to be at. So you don't really know what to do. So you will say yes or no. I am um, not uh, decided is what you're saying. Okay. Uh, so I've told you about uh, among the steps that we have in this K nearest neighbor overview process, we now have looked at distance metrics. The other thing to do was, you know, divide up into test and uh, training state, but then you're going to now evaluate how well your method has done. So we are going to need a way to talk about classification algorithms and how we, we talk about them. In the case of regression, it was easy. We calculate errors. Here is the estimated one. Here is what we are predicting and, and the actual one. And we could say how far we have come. And we, that's what the whole idea behind this residual sum of squares and everything else was there. So the R squared and p-value, they were about accuracy. Now you are going to classify. So you will now say, how many times did I get it right? And there are many multiple ways to get it right. Uh, you can get it right when it is, for example, if it's a binary decision of zero one type of classification, uh, you classify the positives as positives, the negatives as negatives as they are called. And so I'm going to use this metric now to talk about classifications. You've got two choices, yes and no, sick or not sick, uh, binary decisions to make zero and one, right? And, and so this is the predicted one and here is the actual one. You get it right when you classify a one as a one. You also get it right when you classify a zero as a zero. Whenever you say a zero is a one or a one is a zero, uh, when it actually is the other way around, you made a mistake. And these things have names. You know them, you have heard them on the TUs of this space all the time, for example. True positive and true negative, those are the correct ones, and false negative and false positive are those the ones that are wrong ones. Here is a place, it's a side note, where the same thing is called by different things in different domains, and sometimes where you're coming from would tell you how you're going to say these things. Uh, in medicine, epidemiology, and most of biology and things like that, your method could be doing a good job in terms of finding the positive ones as positive and the negative ones as negative, true positive and true negative. And that ability is called the method's sensitivity. When it is not doing that, the, to the, the, the rate of it, when it is uh, the true negative rate, is, when, when it is finding that the positive ones as positive is the specificity and the negative ones as negative is, okay, the true ones as true when you find them is sensitivity and the negative ones when they are negative, your ability to do that is a specificity, okay? Uh, that's the epidemiology, biology, sciences in general. Uh, in information retrieval, in machine in business applications and so on, the sensitivity is also called recall. You probably have heard that more often these days. Recall is another name for 
sensitivity. Now, these were when things were, uh, you know, there, there were four entries in this two by two metrics I just told you. There are very many ways in which you can combine them to get a single metric. So the most common one to do is called accuracy. And you are going to now see the ratio between how many labels you've got them correct, positive or negative, and you divide them by how many total labels you have. The, uh, the recipe, the uh, one minus of this is called the misclassification rate. When your accuracy is high, you get them high. And if you subtract it from one, you will get the misclassification rate. But there are also other ways in which those four things in your uh, metric, uh, in your metrics could be divided to get some other notions. One of them is called precision. This will be the number of true positives divided by the number of true positives plus the number of false positives. Recall. The other term for sensitivity, the number of true positives divided by the number of true positives plus number of false negatives. Um, you are also have, and this is a very common practice, and I would encourage you for those of you who have projects that you would do at, that are around classification, a way to get them these two numbers to one, and that's called an F score. So this is uh, the harmonic mean of precision and recall. And so here is the mathematical way to define them. So we got four out of, or five of them, out of those four numbers that you can compare. And now you're talking about how to evaluate the metric, the, the Keynes neighbor process. So I'm going to show you the, with this slide how you do things in R. This is going to be fast, okay? Uh, just like we saw some many other methods in R, uh, you just have a function name to remember to call, and then you give a bunch of different parameters to it. And so there is a method called k nearest neighbors, uh, KNN, and then you will specify the training and the test set, and then you start enumerating a few different things, and that's what these arguments are. And so I just wanted to show you that there exists a method, and here is how it is called. And that's probably enough for me to say about this slide and move on to the next one. Uh, how do you choose K? Okay. Uh, I'm going to ask if you are with me. Okay, and somebody, I've got two thumbs up there for those who've been coming on. Can I get somebody yes? Okay, can I get one more yes? Okay, perfect. I've got two yes. This also tells me you're still listening to me. All right, okay, okay, okay. Thank you very much. So uh, we are going to choose K. Uh, we know how to evaluate. Uh, we know what kind of distance metrics we have at our disposals, when to use them. If we're going to a restaurant, how to decide whether somebody's going to be give a big tips or not. We all know this now. What we are going to do then is to choose a K. Uh, so we try different, as the overview method told us, we try different Ks. We have an evaluation metric, and now we could use one of these, the F score, the precision, or the recall, or something like that. And we pick the K that gave us the highest or the best that optimizes this chosen evaluation metric. Um, and then we decide our K. When the problem is binary, like the tips, whether the customer is going to give a um, big tip or not, it's a good idea to choose your K to be odd. This is what the 101 of things is when you have served in a committee, which you have. I know when you were in high school, also now when you are in college, you do that. You don't put a committee of four people because what would happen if they decide to vote 2-2, two, two, you will be in trouble. So you'll get some way to break ties. And that's why you would need to pick a K that's odd number. It's a very common thing to do uh, when you have a binary classification. So that, that problem about the big T problem would have been solved if K was not two. But because we have K equals to two, we ended up in a tie. So a common practice is for K to, and so don't be surprised if you see published work or code where people have decided on a K that is an odd number when the problem is binary classification. Uh, so we, this is how you choose. You choose the one that optimizes an evaluation metric. And if you already know your problem is binary classification, even if you were to get according to what the optimization method told you to choose k equals to two, you ignore that and you go with three or one. Uh, it's very unlikely that you would ever want to go with k equals to one. There are some data sets for which this would make sense, but usually would want three or, or five or something like that. But there are some times when k equals to one is a good choice for a binary classification because of how the data is distributed. The other thing, the other bullet point that you see there talks about scale you will be surprised by how important this point is. And we'll revisit this when we talk about unsupervised learning. 
talk about vectors and, and you know, talking about distance between them and you've got Euclidean and things like that. What it would happen if these things that you're trying to compare are coming from all kinds of different scales. One of them is talking about things you bought and it's talking about hundred thousands of dollars and the other one is cents. If you were to just go by distance now and think of this uh, dimensions of your vector just equally important, you will be mislaid. And so for that reason, you want to standardize the data that you are working with so that all the variables are given with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. This is a procedure you can apply and it will make a drastic difference in how your algorithm performs. And, and so do it as a practice to, do, to standardize it. There are times when it's not a good thing. We'll talk about those sort of things, but generally speaking, when your uh, vector, when your features are coming from scales of a very different nature because they could mislead you, you would standardize them. And fortunately in R and many other places, also you have a function, a simple function that you can call to achieve that. That's the point I wanted to talk about. Um, okay, I've told you before, I don't care too much about how things are called, you know, hierarchy, this and that. And so, and so uh, k nearest neighbor is a non-parametric method, if it means anything to you. Parametric methods are where there are parameters and k non-parametric methods are the ones with, that don't have parameters uh, in your model that is. Uh, and so it is known for that, but there is a k that we have to decide and therefore, in some ways, you could say that's the parameter I'm choosing, but it is called non-parametric because it doesn't involve these other things that uh, uh, model parameters would be used to, to, to do. Uh, so that's the note. Uh, but there are some assumptions that are made nonetheless, even though it's a non-parametric method. What are they? First, you're assuming that the data is in some feature space where distance makes sense. And it's true for most cases, but it is not entirely true all the time. And so you should apply k nearest neighbors when the notion of distance is meaningful. Uh, you, of course, would need to have some training data for you to be able to say k of my neighbors have the same label and therefore I'm giving it. You better have some labels, otherwise you will not be able to do that. So, so the training data has been classified as an assumption and you pick the number of neighbors to use as k and you are assuming the observed features that the labels and the labels are associated. The last one needs a little bit uh, of convincing, right? You are saying, first you decided on a distance metric and we use, or the algorithm would say, because the distance is small, because these things are similar, I'm going to label it this way. That is not always true. I can take you back to you, your Facebook friends network you took some friends and you two, you know, uh, people, two persons in that network and then say they are similar. Why? Because there was a lot of overlap between the common friends that they have. And so you divided them by the union and you did all the trick. And you say they are similar. Why? Because you chose this one. And the, but these people could be very different. They could have had the same, you know, neighbors and so on. In reality, they could be very different people. I mean, they just have different interests, they have different affiliations, they have different values and all of those things. And so it, you, what you are saying is what you used as a metric for measuring distance at, actually has got an association with the labels that you're giving them. So that's an assumption. It's a fair assumption, but it is an assumption nonetheless. And that's probably the last point I want to make with this. And I'm happy that we managed to get this thing done before 10 a.m. just a minute before 10 a.m. So I'm going to stop and see if you have any questions for me. Let me see if it's actually the last slide. Hey, it is. Any questions for me? Yeah, that's a good question. Do all the features have the same importance? Uh, the way we have defined some of these distance metrics, they do, uh, but you could have your own weighted ways to do them. And in fact, that's one of the places where k nearest neighbor could be used in a creative way, just like the restaurant example. Uh, and remember the Manhattan and Euclidean distance, um, the nature of the data favored us to go one way or another, right? But we're still talking about distance that is in space. And so we, we did that, but they were still considered the same way, the importance. So you can have weighted versions uh, and that is up to the customization of how your distance metric is measured. Standard procedures, when you call a function like in R, would do them equally. They would weigh them equally. But that was a great question. 
I have a large number of features. Do we reduce the Oh, well, yes. This is, this is a fundamental question. So when you have too many features, what do you do? That's what dimensionality reduction means. And so you actually, uh, K nearest neighbor, one of the things that it could be too is uh, that it is sensitive. And therefore, uh, if you actually get to a dimension, uh, reduce dimension in a good way, so that now you have placed things in a space that is, well, this distance would be very meaningful, that would be a great thing to do. That's a fundamental question to, to do. Dimensionality reduction is a good thing to do when you have very high dimensions, of course. Okay, so now next time, make it a habit, Just, you know, log in by 9.05 or 9.07 or something. I just want to start talking and talking at 9.10 and so that we have all the things we want to do. There are lots of topics left and so I want us to always have enough time to finish. I'm happy to wait for you today.